I am going to try to end this talk at like not the faculty but the students. So if you don't understand something, don't be shy, especially if you're in my class. Um, uh, just let me know if something's not clear. So my lab focuses on um, anticipation of food, and I'll describe that in more detail. But like you'd imagine, like maybe Chelsea forgot to um, order the pizza today, and you still have to come here listen to me for an hour. Your stomach would be rumbling, you'd be kind of antsy, uh, assuming that you normally eat around this time of day. And that's essentially what we're trying to figure out. What neural systems are involved in, um, in timing our food intake, or in training, is the fancier word. And this is an important problem um, for all organisms, is that we have to time our activity to when resources are available to us. And this is just a rather dramatic example of that. So if you look at the activity of a typical um, nocturnal mammal, and you plot its activity on the y-axis, so how many seconds per hour is it active? I'm going to show a lot of graphs like this. Um, this is when the lights are off, that's this dark box. And the nocturnal animal is mostly active at night and not much during the day. Um, and blue throughout this whole talk is mice that have um, as much food as they care to eat, just sitting there over their heads all the time. Um, so, you know, this looks a little bit like an undergrad. Undergrad would have a few blips here to show up for class. But essentially, um, mice are active at night and not during the day. And, um, but I'm going to argue in this talk that actually um, that normal structures involved in different appetitive drives, like hunger, um, mating drives, and, um, and reward pathways, might all be kind of acting in concert to cause this one peak in activity, but it might be due to different structures in the brain. So I'll come back to this slide in the very end, but I do promise I'm a little soft-spoken, a little bit quiet, so don't fall asleep, because I'm going to talk about sex in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a great way to get everyone's attention, just in case you ever get to give a talk. If you can work sex in there, people listen. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is find uh, a neural circuit, basically. So what I knew when I started my lab at Caltech was that when mice are hungry, um, they tend to become more active. They don't play tennis, but this is just meant to be that they're more active. And somewhere there's a, a neural circuit operating in here, but we didn't know really where to look. But we knew our input was hunger, so hunger sensing is an input, and output would be increased activity. So the question we're trying to ask is, is there a hunger clock in the brain? Is there a, a hunger-regulated oscillator that's telling an animal when to get up and look for food? And I just want to walk through like maybe the very first experiment I did when I got my lab. Um, we took uh, a bunch of mice, in this case I think it was 16 mice, and we video recorded their behavior. And I'll show you in another slide or two how we measured their behavior from those videos. And mice normally have as much food as they want to eat, but we kept track of how much they're eating. So, um, like Jason's eating like four pieces of pizza. Um, so, essentially, like what we're going to do is we're going to restrict we're going to restrict the mice like like to sixty percent of that. So I would give Jason maybe three pieces or like two and three quarters. Like next time, if I wanted to keep them at a calorie restricted level. So we left half the mice with continuous access to as much food as they wanted to eat. We call that ad libitum, free access to food. And then the other half of the mice, we just gave them 60% of what they were eating back here when we measured it. And throughout the talk, blue is always mice on an ad diet, red is always mice on a 60% calorie restricted diet. And I'm only kidding, we only had two or maybe three pieces. Um, so we use some very sophisticated computer vision software to actually, we take a video of the mice, we walk away, come back 24 hours later, grab the video, bring it back to another computer in the lab, and this um, computer has some software on it that can basically figure out where the mouse is relative to the other components of the cage. So this is just a mouse in this cage. I tell the software, this is the top left corner of the cage, this is the top right corner, this is the drinking spout, this is the bedding, the floor of the cage, blah, blah, blah. 
and the software can essentially take it from there and tell me how many times it was drinking or for how much time it drank and when it drank, how many times it stuck its um, snout into the food bin, or how many times it hung upside down on the wire rack. So this is how we measure activity and eating related behaviors. So if you give a mouse just 60% of what it would normally eat, um, it eats it very quickly after, after it's been on this feeding schedule for, um, in this case, 24 days, but this happens even within seven days. So if I give Jason just his three pieces of pizza for a whole day, he's going to eat them like, right away. So this, basically this value just means that these animals eat mice on calorie restriction, spend about 1,000 seconds in the first hour, so 3,600 seconds total, possibly, time. Um, they spend 1,000 of those seconds eating their food, and then they had no food left to eat, so they didn't really enter the food bin for the rest of this video recording. And they're going to get fed again right here. Whereas a mouse that has aldebitum access to food, actually they tend to eat all night long, which is when they're most active. So that, that's shown here that basically mice on aldebitum diets don't eat much during the day. And I want to show what happens when we go to feed these mice. It was so obvious that we couldn't help but notice it. Um, we're feeding them the same time every day. And this is daylight conditions, so it would be much darker if it was nighttime. And they're running all over the place, um, waiting for this meal to come. So we're excited. And we quantify this in the next figure. We decided, well, let's just add up how much time they spend walking, jumping, hanging, or rearing up and down, uh, coming off their forelimbs. And let's just call that high activity, like really intense activity behaviors. So throughout the rest of the talk, high activity just means walking, jumping, hanging, and rearing up and down. And you can see that control mice in blue, the data is a little messy, but control mice in blue, they're mostly active during the lights off period. Um, and there is quite a bit of activity in mice on calorie restriction at night. But then um, there's this big spike in activity two, sometimes three, sometimes just one hour before their meal is coming. And we call this um, food anticipatory activity. So we went up, set about next to ask, like, what, uh, how many meals can be anticipated? Like, what are the properties of this behavior? Um, and um, we looked at, uh, for example, like how much do you have to restrict them? Like, can you give them 80% calorie restriction and still see this behavior? Can you give them 40% and still see it? And basically, to summarize those experiments, uh, we found that the more severe restriction led to faster like, entrainment. We see this anticipation building up within just a few days if we really severely restricted the mice. Um, and I'm going to go through some other interval that we tried, um, and to make, I'll show you the data, but I'll probably go through it rather fast. We've basically been able to get mice to respond to um, very um, short intervals of feeding uh, as well. So this food clock, we think, operates over like a very broad dynamic range. So um, as the technician I have <coughs> this issue, she started feeding mice on 12 hour intervals, and we found that if you give a 30% meal here, and a 30% meal here, so you're still keeping 60% CR constant throughout the day. Um, we, we saw that mice could anticipate two meals. Indeed, they could also anticipate three meals spaced eight hours apart. Now we're, you know, each meal is 20% of what they would normally want to eat. And we've gone on and we've even um, um, looked at, uh, like, as far as 30-minute um, intervals. and. Um, I'm going to show you this population of mice, but it's kind of messy, so I'm going to just look at one, one animal. And um, we're looking at, we're feeding it over a three hour period, but every 30 minutes. And we found that even on this short time scale, these mice could anticipate or show a big burst of activity. Like they finish eating, so okay, yellow arrow. Food, it's kind of active, and then it gets a feeding event. Activity goes down to zero, it's basically just eating. And then, it finishes its food, and it's like, oh, I want more food, and it's just activity just shoots right up again. And that happens um, for each of these six feedings, and even, I think this is quite interesting, 
there was no feeding event here, but it's still new to like it ramped its activity up and then it went right back down again, like suggesting that there's you know, an, an all like an oscillatory mechanism in the brain telling it to become active, and it's entrained to this 30 minute feeding loop. So I was really happy at this point. I was like, you know, I've got this really robust behavior, and um, you know, I, it's pretty easy to measure it, and. Um, I'm just, no one really cares about this, I don't think, so I've got my space and my intellectual freedom, and I've got all the time in the world, um, and uh, yeah, it's feeling pretty good. But then, uh, <laughs> then I found the right like terms to put in, like, in my research, so this is like my kind of like lesson to you, I hope you, you can learn from my mistake, it's just casting a wider net in terms of your like, searching pub net <laughs> for what other people have done. So I've been using this term food anticipatory activity, um, which I got, I found out by accident, this has been described 40, 30 years ago. Um, so there's been like essentially a 30 or 40 year search for the neural substrate of this behavior, and no one really has found the brain area um, that, that controls it. So I was like, whoosh, okay, at least like, no one knows the brain area controls this, but damn, this is kind of scary. Like, you know, 30 years of people looking for this brain area. Well, anyway. Um, I'll show you a little data that I think it's not conclusive by any stretch, but that is suggestive at least that um, we are maybe a part of the circuit that controls this behavior. Um, so there, there is a food and um, train oscillator that's capable of redistributing activity. Um, that's you know not a new result. I thought it was, but I was wrong. Um, and this is a new result, though, that the food and train oscillator can operate on, on non-circadian. And that's more of it just because a lot of people that study this behavior are circadian biologists and um, they're coming at it from a different angle and different perspective. And we tried some experiments that they hadn't tried before. So I just wanted, I promised you sex, of oh, sex, um, <laughs> of mouse sex. So we, we actually, during this time, we were also asking, is this anticipatory activity, is it specific for feeding or these extreme hunger conditions? So we were kind of thinking, oh, what else do mice, what else do they like, what else do they want to do? So one experiment that, that we tried was um, we took singly housed males and we gave them access to a different female mouse for an hour every day at the same time, similar to like delivering food at the same time every day. And we looked at activity patterns that result in this. Are people too young to know George Michael in this crowd? Uh, yeah, right. I, want your sex. I want your sex. That's a great song from the 80s. going, but quite often actually the interactions between the males and females were not leading to any um, population. Sometimes they were just ignoring each other. But despite that, we were surprised to see that if we looked, this is just looking in two hours before the, um, the mating access, we did see that if you, if you look at the amount of activity, this, this strange green color is males that had female access, and the blue is control mice that just had uh, their cages moved around and disturbed as a, as a negative control. We found that um, there were some mice, especially after four weeks of this schedule, that were kind of getting up and getting excited uh, a couple hours before they had access to females. Um, and we also did a different experiment uh, where we, again, like we wanted mice to have as much to eat as they wanted to, but we wanted to like layer on a reward to that. And we basically gave them um, chocolate at the same time every day. We also had a group of mice that we gave, it's called rodent high fat diet. It's a way, it's a very palatable food for mice. We also did cheese, we also did peanut butter, and I might be forgetting one or two other uh, foods. And what we found, again, it was rather subtle, um, but mice in yellow got high fat diet every day, and we could see that after a couple weeks of the schedule, they could show an increase in activity before that scheduled meal. But um, this is, I don't expect you to read these numbers, just look at the colors. Um, these are the mice getting high fat. You can see basically this is a ratio of how much, how active they were at night to how active they were before the meal. And essentially you can see that there were some mice that never really showed much activity in anticipation of the meal. And those are colored like white basically, so this ratio is less than 0.4. Don't worry about what that number means. Um, but there were some mice that really seemed to get it quite well 
Uh, and this mouse was showing basically more activity in anticipation of its high fat diet than it did at nighttime. Um, but, so we don't understand the biological basis of this variability um, in response to high fat diet or other palatable meals. Um, and because the effects we see are so small, we haven't really done much more work with this model. And also we haven't done much more work with this um, restricted um, baiting axis because it just involves a lot of mice and um, it's quite, quite costly and it doesn't induce that strong of uh, anticipatory activity. So we've essentially been working with the 60% calorie restriction um, from now on. And just so you don't think that everything we do causes anticipatory activity, we tried a bunch of other things. Um, we gave mice access to uh, running wheels for a couple hours uh, in the middle of the day, every day, for I think 21 or 28 days. Or we gave them shelter, or we gave them nothing at all. And what we found is that even though they were actually spending tons and tons of time running, um, these mice after the first week, it didn't lead to any anticipation or any activity increase, like an increase in activity before we gave them the running wheel. So they would use it, but they didn't get up, they didn't wake up and anticipate it. Is that clear? So um, we did find that other kinds of stimuli not involving extreme hunger can lead to anticipatory activity, um, such as like fatty meals. And I forgot to say these meals are about 25 to 30 percent of the calories the mouse would eat for a day. So it's it's a fairly large snack. Um, sex and not running wheels. And if anyone can think of other things that we might do to mice every day, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears, uh, willing to try other things. So back to our circuit. So we we, we basically went back to our 60 percent calorie restriction, hungry mice, and we're thinking a lot about. Well, what are the inputs? What are hunger sensing? What hunger sensing pathways might be involved in transforming this um, hunger state into increased activity? And we spend a lot of time, and other people as well, looking at different um, mutants in hunger sensing pathways. This is one of the more famous um, mice of all time. Um, <laughs> this is called the Obi Obi mouse. Um, it, it's it's very very obese. They get to be about I think three or four or five times as massive as a control mouse. You can see this is at least worth two mice. Um, and I think these are the same age and everything. So basically, these mice lack leptin. Leptin is a satiety hormone, so leptin is telling you, hey, stop eating pizza, you know. Um, I'm full. I'm full. You know, um, I don't need any more pizza. Um, these mice don't have that, so they just keep eating and eating. And they have other phenotypes as well. So we thought, okay, at least like as a proof of concept, if your if your hunger signal's always on, then if you look two hours before they're gonna get their meal, they're very active. So that's all this bar graph is meaning to show. A couple hours before meal time, wild type mice are very active if they're on calorie restriction. Wild type mice on an adlibetum or free access to food diet, they're very inactive at this time of day before the scheduled, in their case, scheduled handling. Um, Whereas these leptin knockout mice, they really didn't show much of an increase in activity preceding the meal. Or they did a little bit, but so did the control mice, which had ad libitum access to food. Um, and anyway, long story short, we did look at the components of what we're calling high activity, like hanging, jumping, rearing, walking. And what we were kind of surprised to see is that we did feel that leptin mice left in null mice could anticipate feeding because they actually did show increase specifically in hanging behavior. Well, how could like high activity show one thing, hanging behavior show another? Well, hanging behavior is very, very rare in these mice. They're really fat. It's really kind of funny to watch them try to hang. Um, <laughs> they, don't, they, they don't really walk around much, but that we thought that maybe they did know that food was coming. And the reason we were able to see that is because we weren't looking at the activity as a composite, but we were looking at the, the pieces of different activity behaviors. So we were like, all right, you know, even this, even these hunger sensing mice and all these other experiments that other labs are doing, we looked at about five other or four other knockouts in different hunger sensing pathways. We looked at orexin, ghrelin knockouts, neuropeptide Y knockouts, and we were really surprised. They all had normal food anticipation. So we kind of, I would say, kind of gave up or moved on from looking at the, um, the hunger sensing part of the circuit. And plus, it was like maybe 15 other labs that had looked or were actively looking at this 
end of the circuit. So we wanted to get a little more closer to the activity regulation or maybe the rewarding aspects of food. And at that point, um, it seemed like dopamine as a neurotransmitter involved in locomotion and reward was an obvious candidate that no one had really done much work with. So I'm going to show you a few videos. I found from teaching bio 378 videos are like a great way to get people's attention. Um, of mice, um, where we're recording from a region that's innervated by dopamine neurons, it's called the dorsal striatum. Um, and we're recording electrical activity here in mice anticipating feeding. And then I'll tell you about some of the manipulations we've done to dopamine in the dorsal striatum and, and a little bit uh, and in the entire striatum as well. And oh, sorry, dopamine didn't just fall out of the sky. Um, it, it's been known, uh, and the dorsal striatum didn't fall out of the sky either. It's been known that the, this part of the brain is involved in timing mechanisms. Um, typically on very short scales, those seconds to minutes, um, but also that it's very important in ritualistic and habitual behaviors. Um, and feeding certainly seems to fall under that, that category. Um, interestingly, in a lot of obese humans, um, the dorsal striatum is overly active in response to different uh, feeding stimuli. This is known from functional magnetic resonance imaging studies. And um, the other thing that was kind of caught our eye was that there's a lot of um, circadian genes that are rhythmically expressed. So if you look at different times of day, their expression is going up and down in the dorsal striatum. I just want to show. Um, so this is the olfactory bulb of a mouse. This is its cortex, and then. Under that is the striatum here. And the dopamine neurons, they basically live here and they send innervations to the striatum. And it depends on what part of the midbrain you're in. These dopamine neurons send projections mostly to the lower part of the striatum, also called nucleus accumbens. And these dopamine neurons that are in the lateral part of the midbrain, they send projections up into the dorsal striatum. And if you want to know how to use this tool, it's really fun. You can ask anyone who's taken Bio 378. What are we going to do? When we got started with the uh, in vivo electrophysiology, one of the, we were still interested in hunger inputs and hypothalamic pathways. So hypothalamus is a part of the brain that's very important for regulated feeding. And so we were putting electrodes down in here, and we had mice anticipating food, but we never really saw increases in, in the amount of firing of neurons in anticipation of meals. Mostly we saw neurons that turned on um, after food was presented, which is very consistent with the goal of the hypothalamus in mediating like digestion and um, energy metabolism. But then we started putting electrodes into the, uh, the dorsal striatum, and that's just shown here. So we use tungsten micro wires, um, very thin wires, and we thread them through a cannula, and we stick that cannula through a hole we make in the skull, and then we glue that all together onto the skull, and then we're left with some wires in the mouse's brain. I'll show you a picture of a mouse that has a, a probe implanted into its brain. So this is the dental cement, this is the probe, and then we plug this in to um, some more wires that go out to amplifiers so that we can detect the electrical activity in the brain. And this is just a picture of top view down of a mouse in its cage, and this mouse is plugged in. and. I think uh, it's not anticipating food. There's food all over the floor, actually. So let's look again at a mouse that's been trained to anticipate its food. In this case, I think it was um, expecting meals every 24 minutes, like in the late afternoon. Just bear with me. This is a little slow. And it did work. 
just 30 minutes ago. see me cry. This is my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> This is the mouse that's just been fed because the first video didn't play. So the first video he was running around anticipating, now he's been fed and you don't see much activity and you can't hear much either. Um, I don't know why the first video didn't play, but okay, there was a, that, that was electrical activity, but not much. Um, and then this is him, you know, 10, 10 minutes after he's finished this meal. He's waiting for his next meal coming in about five more minutes. of these, these types of videos because um, we're in a locomotor region and we want to make sure we're not just recording for neurons that are um, initiating motor movements or participating in locomotor control. Um, we don't think that's what's happening, but we actually have a lot of work you know, cut out, like a work ahead of us to show that that's not the case, or maybe it will be the case. Um, so, so we're excited, you know, at least we put our electrodes in this part of the brain. We see increases in firing before um, food's delivered. Um, so this is great. But it doesn't prove, really, that this region is causing food anticipation. Um, it's just a correlation between firing and this brain region and feeding. So again, here's our here's, um, a coronal section of the mouse brain, so cut this way. This striatum is stained very nicely with a enzyme called, uh, with an antibody against an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, it's a great marker of dopamine neurons. And we think that this part of the brain is an important part of the ability to anticipate food. So we, we need to manipulate the dopamine system. Um, the problem is that dopamine can't just be knocked out. Um, <coughs> It's expressed, dopamine neurons live in a bunch of different parts of the brain, and you can deplete them, but you can't completely eliminate them and have a mouse or a rat actually survive. Um, so I knew of some work um, by a professor at the University of Washington, um, and they come up with a really nice genetic model where they could um, essentially only express dopamine in certain parts of the brain. And they use the genetic trick to do that. And I don't necessarily want to go into that. But I'm happy if, if you want to ask me about that. I'll tell you what they did. Um, but essentially, rather than having dopamine in the entire striatum, they were able to restore it um, 
just in the dorsal part of the striatum. So all these other areas that have dopamine normally, in this mouse I'm showing you, there's no dopamine in the hypothalamus, non olfactory bulb, and just a little bit in substantia nigra. Um, and then those neurons project up here. That's why the dorsal striatum has dopamine. So I said, this is, I said Professor Palmer, you know, hey, will you come give a talk at Caltech? And he said, oh, yeah, sure. And I was like, okay. Hey, do you want to go to dinner? Yeah, we'll go to dinner, give him a glass of wine. You know, things are going well. Hey, do you want another appetizer? And then I gave him another glass of wine. And then I was like, okay, fine there. He's a little, little buzz. I said, hey, can you um, make some of these mice for us and send them to us? Because they're actually kind of tough to me. And he said, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. So basically, a postdoc in his lab, Mark Darvis, um, he, we collaborated. And we had about five or six of these mice and then control mice that receive, receive surgeries that are otherwise wild type. And we, we asked the question, if you have dopamine only in this part of your brain, can you still anticipate uh, a daily feeding event? And the, their ability was slightly delayed, but essentially they were able to anticipate food with dopamine only in this part of the brain, dorsal striatum. So that was, that was an exciting result. Um, their ability to do so was not quite as strong as control mice, but um, but it basically told us that if, if dopamine's involved, it's only involved in this part of the brain, because dopamine's not expressed anywhere else in these mice. And then we wondered, well, what about dopamine receptors? Um, there's different receptors for dopamine. This is an in situ hybridization, just showing the mRNA expression of dopamine receptor one. It's very high in the striatum. So we were able to get mice that were knocked out for D1 are dopamine receptor 1 knockouts. And we tested whether these mice could anticipate um, daily feeding events. And um, what we were quite excited to find is that in mice lacking D1R, uh, shown, shown in red, so this is maybe a little confusing. So blue in this case, it's wild type mice on calorie restriction. So I don't have ad libitum controls to show you. This is like ongoing experiments right now. So we only, we took the first set of D1Rs and controls and we put them all in calorie restriction. And we see this big increase in activity in wild type mice in anticipation of the feeding event, but only a little increase in the D1R knockouts. So I can't say that they don't anticipate at all. There are a few mice that show an increase in activity, and some, the most really show no increase in activity. Um, so this is after 21 days, and 28 days is usually the last day we do the experiment. Again, we still saw that the D1R mice were really impaired in their ability to anticipate feeding. Um, we also looked at another dopamine receptor mutant mouse, D2R, and we found that the D2Rs really had good food anticipation. So now we think, okay, at least like half the neurons in the striatum express D1R, half of them express D2R. We don't have to worry about the ones that express D2R because we know that they're not required for food anticipation. So now we're more excited to look at D1R expressing neurons. Um, But to try to like nail this down like even further, we wanted to confirm these results. And what we tried to do was to deplete dopamine in the dorsal striatum. So leave dopamine everywhere else in the brain, but take it away only in the dorsal striatum. So this is basically I injected a toxin on this side of the brain. Um, you can see a little damage from the needle there. Um, so I injected a toxin that specifically kills dopamine neurons. It doesn't really bother any other neurons. And you can see the tyrosine hydroxylase staining. Um, is gone in this area where I injected the toxin. On the opposite side of the brain, where I didn't inject um, any toxin, there's very robust staining in the dorsal striatum. So what we spent most of the summer doing was trying to create mice with bilateral lesions of dopamine neurons in the dorsal striatum. And we wanted to see if their ability to anticipate food was, was impaired. And I don't have that data to show you. We were not very good at making bilateral um, lesions, like we often got results where one side was quite nicely lesioned, but the other, you know, we maybe were, were a little bit too wide and we got the lateral part but not the medial part in the striatum. But from looking at enough of these mice um, that had decent bilateral lesions, we also saw that their food, their ability to anticipate mealtime was impaired. It wasn't gone, but it was impaired. So it's sort of consistent with what we were thinking. So yeah, like everything was, you know, it was going really well. Um, dopamine, dorsal striatum. But then, like, I was reading more papers about dopamine, and I found 
another mouse model to test. Okay, this mouse model is mutant in um, in a transcription factor called PITX3. And what's special about this mouse is basically that it's a natural model of a of a dopamine depletion in the dorsal strain. So this is a control mouse. It's a litter mate of a PIX3 knockout. This is TH staining in the striatum. Lots of striatal dopamine. Um, this is TH staining in a PIX3 knockout. It's basically the dorsal striatum is basically depleted almost completely of dopaminergic innervation. But, and I don't have the data to show you because I forgot it, um, these mice are really good at anticipating their daily meal time. So that was kind of awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and then my collaborator, who I mentioned before, Mark, he said, hey, you know, I've got these other mice um, uh, that basically lack dopamine throughout the striatum. Why don't you test those? I was like, I didn't know about the PIX3 result yet, so I was like, yeah, bring them along. You know, I'm really confident in this, these results. So um, we also got mice and Martin quantitated how much dopamine was in the dorsal and ventral striatum. You can see there's basically nothing left, or maybe like a 40-fold reduction in dopamine throughout the striatum in these animals. And this is some staining I did. I kind of overexposed the stain. I just wanted to show you. This is another piece of the tissue that's not it's down here somewhere. So the staining should be really dark brown. Basically, there's no dopamine, dopamine stain that I can detect in the striatum. But again, these mice um, were quite good at anticipating their daily meal. Um, so, you know, we're, we've been scratching our heads a little bit about this. So, what I've shown you, or I hope I've convinced you of, is that dopamine is required only in the dorsal striatum to permit food dissipation. Um, that the dopamine receptor 1, but not receptor 2, is, is also necessary for food dissipation. And that lesioning, I didn't show you the data, but trust me, lesioning diminishes the ability to dissipate food. But on the other hand, in two other models of dopamine depletion, um, we see no impairments in food anticipation. So that's sort of where we're at, like today, right now. And um, you know, as I was driving over, I thought, oh, OK, I'm just going to invoke compensatory mechanisms um, and cover up like points four and five. So, <laughs> classic trick of anyone doing genetic research, so I'm going to use it too. So basically, compensatory mechanisms mean like, oh, well, you delete PIX3 early on and something else happens in these animals, and they rewire their striatum and they just take food. And that is honestly, though, the only difference that I can really think of between um, these models are very early events, so PIX3 gets deleted during development. Um, this, These mice, I didn't tell you how they're made, but Again, embryonically, dopamine is knocked out in both of these. Um, and maybe that's the difference that, that we're seeing. But I really don't know, and I hope to figure it out in the next few, few months so I can get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I, told you I, I told you I'd come back to this again. Um, and as promised, here it is. Mice are normally active at night. Um, people are normally active during the day. And I think it's due to um, different parts of the brain like, that are involved in different repetitive drives, like wanting of sex, wanting of food, and wanting of uh, social interaction, what have you, that they're all in synchrony normally. So normally we just see one big activity peak in mice at night. But if we take like this feeding oscillator and we feed it at a time when mice aren't normally active, we can pull some of the activity out of this peak and bring it over here. We can do that with sex also. We can do that with some food rewards, although not that well. Um, so, yeah, the way I think of it is that there are many different, there are probably several different oscillator clocks in the brain that are all in synchrony. They're all telling the same time. Um, and that most, for the most part, makes sense that you want to constrain your activity um, to certain times of day when resources and needs <coughs> are available. Um, I didn't mention this. I'm not really doing this research because it has medical applications, but often people ask, what's the point of this? Well, it turns out that um, if you feed a mouse or a rat or a monkey, for that matter, 60% calorie restriction for its whole life, it'll actually live um, one and a half times longer than mice that are fed um, ad libitum. Um, and no one understands the mechanism for that. There's about 20 different hypotheses, at least, maybe more, for how calorie restriction relates aging. But I hope that if I find this part of the brain that's responding to 60% calorie restriction, that it might help us understand the connection between diet and longevity. And I also 
think that um, this feeding clock might be involved in um, eating disorders, uh, both where we eat too much and where we eat too little. Um, and I'd like to close probably my most important slide. I'd like to thank all the people in my group that, that contributed to this work. And I also wanted to mention that um, these were like half of these people were undergrads, and the other um, half, my technicians, like Keith, Christian, Matt Luby, and Cynthia Shu, they all had like just graduated from college. And they did most of this work. I didn't do most of this work. So the only people with PhDs involved are like, you know, here and um, and here. But basically, like undergrads, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and this work was paid for by the Broad Foundation, the Ellison Medical Research Foundation and the Carmen Family Foundation. They're interested in eating disorders, they're interested in aging, and they're interested in, you know, more generally in, in biological research. So I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any.
that's trained to a certain feeding schedule, calorie-restricted feeding schedule, mm -hmm. and you give it um, a bunch of food, it completely shuts off this activity pattern. And they just go right back to being active at night and not active during the day. So it turns off very fast. We have done some the opposite experiments where we, um, we can train a mouse to a feeding schedule, and then we just stop feeding it. And in that case, the activity does persist for a couple of cycles. We can't really go too far with that because we don't want the animals to start with that. They were not, and um, that would be a much better way to do the experiment we did. One of our colleagues in Canada, uh, rat, he's doing the study in rats, he was much better about making sure the females are receptive um, to mate, which means they're in estrus, and uh, he got better results than we did, and I think that's why. Or it's because it's rats, and rats are smarter than mice. One more question. We tried water. We tried, yeah, we did try water restriction. Wow. But what we found is that when you water restrict mice, they also stop eating. Um, their chow is really dry and they need water to like solvate it. So we did see anticipation for water access, but we think it could be, we can't say it was really just for water, it could be due to like not having food. And we couldn't figure out another way to test that. Okay, question. Thanks a lot for all your questions and your